This is Julia with Storked the Podcast, in which we explore the many ways to build and define family. We have a really special two-part episode right now with Michael and Tammy. I love two-part episodes because I really think they demonstrate how complicated and interwoven and connected our family building lives are. So rarely do we create a family in a vacuum. And so I want to introduce you to Michael today. Michael is the definition of the word trailblazer. He is a U.S. citizen who grew up in Wyoming, who moved to the U.K., and he and his partner wanted to have a family. And so they looked at their available resources in the U.K. and the limitations at the time that they were exploring the family building process, which were quite significant for gay couples. It was really not something that was done in the U.K. And they went back to the U.S., accessed the fertility treatments and the resources here, and then used their knowledge and their experience to really trailblaze on behalf of all other UK gay couples who want to do the same thing. I think of the story as just a really, really interesting example of using what's driving you deep in your soul to help others. And the reason Michael and Tammy's episodes are linked is because they share two things. The first is that they share the theme that growing up in the US, neither believed that they were able to have a family. Neither of them thought the family building was possible until in 2004, a marriage was made legal in California and Massachusetts. And then for both of them, they say, that was the moment I realized this is something I could do. This is something I could have. So I think that's really special. The second thing that binds them is even more special. And that is an embryo who is now a daughter. We're calling her Baby Z for the purpose of these episodes. And following Michael and his partner's family building journey, they had two remaining embryos and decided to donate them to a friend. So we've got Michael's story first, where he'll talk to us about surrogacy in the UK and how his family came to be. And then we're going to talk to Tammy and learn about her experience of accepting a donated embryo from Michael and his partner. I hope you enjoy these episodes. Like Eddie, if you enjoy them, please share them with family. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram, sign up for the newsletter, or leave us a review. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on Storked, the podcast. This is a podcast in which we explore the many ways to build and define family. And I'm very excited to hear a little bit more about your journey to create your family, because I understand that there's, there's a big and really special story that you have to share with us today. If you could start with a little introduction for us, who you are, then we'll dive into your family building process. Sure. Well, my name is Michael Mills, and I come from the mountains of Wyoming in the United States. And I came to the UK in 1996, and I went to graduate school and then started working in the city. And then in 2000, met my current husband. And soon after that, we started thinking about having a family. That's great. Well, let's talk about your family building. Okay. Uh, well, I think it was in 2006. When my partner and I just had a brief conversation, we, there was a, a television show on the BBC about a gay couple who had really sort of um, forged a new trail within British law that allowed for same-sex surrogates and surrogacy to be possible within the UK. And they went through all the court judgments to make it possible. And so I thought, gosh. I've always wanted to have a family because I knew from a very early age that I was gay. I sort of just thought that well, this is something I'd have to give up. It just didn't seem at all possible, which is beyond the realm of possibility. And all of a sudden at that moment, it's like, wow, this is possible. And then it was almost instantaneous. I just asked my partner, I said, would you like to have kids? I'd really like to have kids. He said, yeah, I would like to have kids. And then it was just from that point on, we sort of just were open to the idea. And it wasn't until about two years later, when my partner and I were in Florida, and we met this guy from California who was just beginning the surrogacy process. And all of a sudden, it went from the abstract something on the television as being possible to we actually have met somebody who is our age, he was single, and had already gone through two cycles, and is just about to, to do a third. And so all of a sudden became absolutely possible from theory to practice. And we thought, wow, okay. And then at that point, we started looking for the egg donors. We thought that would be the most difficult part. I love this, that you found a template, somebody who was doing this. And was that person doing it in the States? Yes, in California. 
Okay, that's curious. Did you find that using that template or that mental model was challenging to import to London or was it easy to take the methodology or the questions that you had for him and apply it to your lives in London? Well, you know, if you talk about templates, the first thing that went into my mind after my partner agreed to have children was, we need to get married. I'm not going to have a child <laughs> outside of wedlock. I mean, so it was like all those old ideas yeah. about family and tradition was like, that was just there. And I, I was adamant that we had to get married before we went on this journey because I didn't want to be in a horrible position in the future mm -hmm. where I would have loved this child and then the relationship could have broken down and then we would have this horrible custody issue. And I just thought, no, this is just not going to happen. So I just sort of used the old existing templates, um, yep. but the modern interpretation of the law. And at the time, there was a lot of groundbreaking work that was done in California, but it was just becoming possible in Massachusetts. And my partner and I had bought a place in Provincetown, so we had a residence in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did as soon as we were able to get married in Massachusetts, because we had a residence there, was, okay, let's get married. And so we invited all of his family and all of my family and all the way back to my grandfather, who didn't know I was gay at the time. And so, you know, we introduced them all to being gay. And then we told them that we were going to have children and just kind of laid it all out on the line. And at first, my sister was going to donate the egg and then my partner was going to do the sperm. But after uh, two IVF cycles, she just was not suitable as a donor. And then we started going through the agency. I'm very curious to talk about the agency process, but there's a couple of things that you've mentioned that I'd love to discover a little bit more about. The first is, you said you applied the old templates, you applied the old models. And I'm hearing you say that there was one model, there was one old model that didn't serve you, which is I'm gay and therefore I don't get to have a family. And then there was one model that did serve you, which is I'd like to be married before starting my family. Can you yes. tell me a little bit about where those models came from for you? I come from a broken family. My father, I mean, he would put it differently, but from my point of view, as an eight-year-old boy abandoned us and ran off with a uh, floozy and uh, <laughs> kind of disappeared for a long time. And, you know, he, he paid a bit of child support, not enough to keep us going. And we had to chase him for that. And it was really rough. And I just remember what it was like feeling very vulnerable and not having any male role models except for my grandfather and watching all the other boys and all the other families kind of have this support structure behind them for their kids to grow up with. I mean, I never had anyone to play catch with me. No one helped me with sports. I mean, in my mother's boyfriend at the time, who later, later became a, a husband, my stepfather taught me how to ride a bike. So it just, it's sort of like there's this absence. And I was just, and my father was such a bad role model, really. I mean, I just thought, I'm not going to do that. If anything, I, I have to be grateful for him being a bad role model because it prevented me from making the same mistakes. And, um, yeah, so that was really where it all started. And that's where the marriage thing came from. And I thought, and then I started applying certain um, shibboleths in my mind to whether this was the right husband. I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, you know, I come from a very religious background, a Christian background. So I was thinking, I was, you know, I was looking up, love is patient, love is kind. So is my new husband going to be patient? Is he going to be kind? Is he going to, you know, I was like, I, if I was going to do this, I was going to do it right. Yeah. And right for you meant all in, fully committed. You know, with the right partner. Yeah. And like with all the surety that was absolutely possible. Yeah. 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 Oh, so it sounds like in a very short period of time, if I'm hearing you correctly, you went from having an, uh, an outdated or outmoded sense of what your family life could be to really diving in, having this, this sense of a clear path and a lot of commitment and connection to your then partner, now husband. Yeah. Well, you know, it, in the gay community, especially being in London, you know, it was sort of the right after the first AIDS scare. And so people were beginning to feel free and there was, we're just beginning to feel it sort of accepted. We were sort of the second wave, 1996. And it was pretty clear after having been on the gay scene for a while that there's a couple things that happen to gay men at about 35 or 40 years of age. You get old, you lose your looks, you lose your sex appeal, and you need something to back yourself up at that point. You know, you need a relationship and you need, and I always put it as, um, you know, I wanted to plant a seed so that later on in life, I would have something that would keep me going. And so that the kids were really that seed. It was sort of like, you know, I want to get married and I want to have kids so that I have a life after I turn 40. Because the sure. gay world is pretty old. There's so much sadness in the gay world after that, you know, 
so many single men who are alone and depressed. And um, I could see it around me and I didn't want to be like that. Do you think that's true just for the British gay community or do you see it in the U.S. one as well? I think it's a worldwide general human thing. Yeah. And is it is it specific to the gay community because of this lack of ability to easily access family building options or is it is it universal? I don't know. I think it has to do with the fact that uh, for most gay men, especially in, in, as we mature, that it's a lot of it's lust and not love. And it's a lot about physical attraction. And then when that goes away, it takes a certain kind of person to become attracted to someone's mind rather than how beautiful yeah. they are or how many muscles they have or what fashion they wear or, you know, that sort of thing. Talk about a template that may not be serving. You know, if if in the straight community, this heteronormative marriage with 2.5 kids may not serve everybody, then perhaps what I'm hearing is in the gay community, this sex appeal, measuring your self-worth by your partners may not be serving everyone. It's true. So the dynamic that was happening for you at the time is that you have this brand new marriage, which you did in Massachusetts. What was going on legally with gay marriage in London at the time? Uh, well, there was no such thing as gay marriage. <laughs> there was no such thing as civil partnerships. It was, we had based everything on marriage laws in Massachusetts. Yeah. So that was, and of course the children were to be born in the United States, so they'd be U.S. citizens. And at that point, that would be the only applicable law. So if there ever was a dissolution or breakdown of the relationship, everything would have been governed by that law, but at least there was something. You mentioned custody. You mentioned the dissolution of a relationship. It's very clear from what you've just said that you were never planning to have that be your, your case. But how much were you looking into the what ifs when family building about you know, what happens if there is a divorce? Who gets custody? How do you manage that? Did you have to worry about that at all? Or were you so focused on this is my right partner and I'm going to do marriage right because I had the template I didn't want from my dad that it was not really a thought? Well, there was the initial sort of, you know, passion, let's make this happen. But then there was the sitting down about let's do it. Yeah. Um, so we, my partner and I actually sat down and we put together we sort of brainstormed all the possible scenarios and what would we do in the event of this. So um, we had this like prenup that we agreed about, you know, in the event that we separated, then this is what would happen. This is in yeah, everything, how we would organize it. And what were some of the points that were important for you? Did you have any specific points that were like, I need this in this document to feel good? Yes. Well, the most important thing was that in the event that the children well, that we were divorced, I never wanted to find myself in a position where I was at a disadvantage with the children because my partner being a very, oh, a banker, <laughs> had a lot more money than I do. I had money in my own right, but his were orders of magnitude greater than mine. And uh, I just felt like we need to make sure that I was in a position in the event of the dissolution where we would be seen as equal. I'd have all the resources I needed and I didn't want there to be this horrible dynamic where one parent was trying to buy off the other child or buy them more gifts and all that sort of. So I, we just worked through all of that stuff. You were starting to tell us about the actual mechanical process of building your family. And you mentioned your sister had offered to be an egg donor. What was your emotional reaction when she offered that? Or, or did she offer? Did you, or did you have to ask? Well, it, was, it, it came the other way. I had mentioned to my sister that we were looking at agencies and that we found a possible egg donor. And then she said, you know, I'll do it. And I thought, wow. So she volunteered. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, my goodness, that's going to make things even more complicated because now we're dealing with two really intense relationships. I'm so grateful for her to have offered that it would have really made things much more complicated. I'm glad that it was a, a third party that was the egg donor. So when she was unable to continue on with the IVF, did you feel sadness at the loss of biological connection to these children? Or was that, how did that feel? Oh, I, I see, because I would, well, not really, because at that point, then the option was that we would get a third party egg donor and I would fertilize half of the eggs and my partner would fertilize the other half. Uh -huh. And so we always wanted two kids. So it was going to be one of his and one of mine. Got it. And is that how it worked out? It, it did. but. <laughs> not because we had planned it that way. I mean, nature has its own way. You know, we, at first we planned, let's have the boy first because we thought we were more comfortable with boys and being men ourselves. And then in the end, we had in fact, the third IVF cycle, the first two being completely 
unproductive and unsuccessful in getting eggs and fertilizers and get them up to the proper state and, and readiness for transplantation. The third one, all we had was girls. That's all that was left after it was the girls. So I thought, okay, so we're having a girl, right? I mean, we're already in hundreds of thousands of dollars and now we're our third cycle. So we thought, okay, we'll just, we're going to have a girl. It's great. And there it was. Yeah. Oh, that's so fun. How did you ultimately select the egg donor? Well, my partner is super logical. You know, he looks at a spreadsheet and he crunches the data. And they, so he's putting together a spreadsheet of everything he wants. You know, he wants grades and he wants some sort of achievement. He wants a minimum height and a maximum height. And, <laughs> and so I, and for me, it was important. I thought, okay, we want them to look sort of like me to have my <laughs> coloring because mine are the recessive traits, the blonde hair, blue eyes, and he's dark. So um, I thought, okay, let's make sure we get, you know, possibility of recessive and recessive so we get some more blonde, blue-eyed kids. And so the, I saw a woman who just, she had everything that I didn't have as a, as a like, you know, being so fair, yeah. very susceptible to the sun. I just felt like also I always grew up kind of, I was a late bloomer, so I was a bit weak and I had to work really hard in order to build my body up and through gymnastics. And I thought, gosh, she looks really strong. And so, I, you know, her background of the egg donor, she's a, a, a major in the U.S. military, swim champion, super clever. And then she had retired from the military and became an entrepreneur. And so like there was just, and then the color, she had this photograph of her as a child and her hair had bleached out white in the sun and she was tan. And I had always wanted to be tan as a child, you know, because the sun would beat me up. I just, I couldn't stay for five minutes in the sun, but boy, you could tell that she had some sort of Scandinavian or something in her. So it's like she had everything I didn't. And I thought that's, that would be a, a good enhancement to the genetic pool. And so she was picked on that basis. And then from the physical traits and then the, the intelligence and the height and everything, you know, that was sort of minimum requirements were met. I am, I'm grinning watching you because for two reasons. One is I'm just loving the way in which you use language to describe people. It's fascinating. You really are gifted with words. But I'm also seeing this energy, this like you're remembering back and picking this woman, but you've seen you just light up with this selection, this choice, which is clear that, it, you know, it was the right choice for you. I kind of read people's emotions. I feel yes. them. And if I get a good vibe from them, I just know instantly and I act on that. And you had a good vibe from her pictures. I just, there was just, it just clicked. You know, there were hundreds of possibilities, but I just remember going through there. It was just, that was the one. And did you get to meet her in person? No, we didn't. It just happened to be on the second cycle of egg donation that we had just like made the sperm of contribution in a test tube for them yeah. to then fertilize the eggs. And the egg donor was just exiting at the same time. And I just stopped in my tracks and I said, that's, I said, is this you? And at the time she wanted to be anonymous. So I, I kind of, you know, approached it very gently and she said, Oh, yes, you must be so and so. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that, that's who it was. And she, then at that point, she said, oh, I, don't, I never asked to be anonymous. I don't mind people knowing. And so at that point, then we got to know her name and we got to know where she lived. And we agreed then that um, we would create a Facebook page for the children and keep updates, which we also then made available to the gestational carrier. So that's mm -hmm. part of the deal. And she has children of her own. And then the, also the very interesting thing about this is that once we knew her name and she was willing to share the name, we also knew that she had done some donations previously to a family of videographers and documentary makers who worked for the BBC, who were traveling the world making documentaries. So we've met the other two daughters yeah. who are about one and a half years older than our, our eldest daughter. So our daughter has three half sisters uh, wait a minute one two three yes and then her brother her half brother who who's also our son who lives here we know all of we've met all of them you've met in, in person you've met all of them. in person yes wow so I'm, I'm struck by this chance encounter with this woman and that sort of changes the trajectory of who's included in your circle mm -hmm. um and that just how special that, that is, that you could have that access. When you say your daughter has met all of her half-siblings, yes. what is her sense of connectedness or how does she feel about having half-siblings? 
Well, she loves the idea of having a sister because she's he, the only female in a family of three men. So she loves the idea. Uh, she is really, yeah, she's really happy to know, to actually know one of them quite closely. And the others, uh, it's kind of an interesting dynamic because her other two other half sisters, we've been invited to go spend some time with them in Maine and to um, you know, get to know them. And the woman who has had these children is happy for us to know each other. But that's sort of, you know, our life is so crazy right now, just trying to keep everything, you know, heading yeah. in the right direction. We don't need to add another layer of complexity, but it's open to us in the future. And, uh, and then, of course, when our daughter, Xenia, was born up until about age of three, we met the egg donor twice in person. So our daughters actually met the egg donor and she, she's held her and looked at her. And we still have photographs of the egg donor. So you can sort of see how she takes after the egg donor, you know, the way she, she stands, her coloring, her body type, her shape. It's just, so it gives, it's really good that it's a known donor because she likes, my, our daughter likes to relate and look at the picture and see what kind of person she might grow up to be. Oh, that's so fabulous. So you found your egg donor, you knew immediately, you saw this picture, she jumped out of you as the one. Did your husband agree when you, you showed him the egg donor? Did he, he say, yes, this is it for me as well? Or did he have to sort of go through the checklist? You know, if, early on, we sort of figured out how to work with each other. I'm very creative and I'm, I have a, a broad perspective. And yet he's extremely focused, very, very focused, hyper-focused kind of person. So as long as he had his criteria, that was fine. So if I put together a range of options, that all met his criteria, then at that point, I'm happy and he's happy. So then I let him have the, you know, the final decision, but he agreed with me. So. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's great. Excellent. Okay. So you've got your, your egg donor and you've got this decision to make two sets of embryos so that you both mm -hmm. can contribute your genetic DNA, et cetera. Did you make the embryos in the States or were you doing yes. those in? Yes. There was the only choice. We flew back and forth from the States and, um, you know, visited the doctor who was going to handle the procedure and yeah. met the gestational carrier, interviewed her, all that. You said it was the only choice. You said that really emphatically. What does that mean? Well, I mean, both my partner and I were very entrepreneurial. And so, and we, we make up our minds, we just go and make it happen. And we had decided we're going to have a family. We're just going to keep going. And once we determined that, you know, our sperm was viable and the eggs were viable, it was just a numbers game. So you just keep going. Right. Funny, people keep asking, yeah. what kept you going after the first and the second and the third, especially people who are going through IVF in a less um, removed process, like a woman who needs a few IVF cycles and she's going to have use her own eggs and her own body mm -hmm. to gestate it. So they're like, you know, they're up and down on the emotional roller coaster and they're like, oh, I don't know if I can take another one. And so in a way, we, it was a bit of a blessing because we didn't have to personally experience that emotional, you know, up and down. So it made it a little bit easier for us, but we still were so invested emotionally and financially in the process. We thought just, you know, just keep going. In the end, it took six, six, six seconds for us to get two kids. And how did you choose the gestational carrier? Well, that, it, as it turned out, although we hadn't anticipated at all that that would have been the hardest, but it was the most difficult. Because really? there were a whole bunch of people who want to be gestational characters who really aren't suitable to be gestational carriers. They're in it for the wrong reason. They don't particularly have the discipline to put the baby before their own needs. And they also might be in it just for the money. There's, and also there were a lot of stories going around about uh, these carriers who play a lot of games and pretend they're pregnant and go through it to get all the bonus. And I mean, there's all these risks, you know, when these, these and, and these opportunities to be duped by people who are not very honorable. So, um, we had met her and I, again, I just, I just looked in her eyes and I met her and then we met her family and she invited us to dinner at her house and she has two children already. And, um, I just thought, yeah, this is going to work. I just got a feeling for it. Oh, that's great. You're, you're really relying on your gut in a very powerful way. And it sounds like, yeah, my like, partner's like, are you sure? I was like, yep. <laughs> you know, I just knew. Yeah, I knew. Excellent. <laughs> well, so now we have two wonderful children after some complications, some setbacks, some, some great leaps forward and a chance encounter with an egg donor. What would you tell somebody who's going through the process now? What have you learned that you would like to share with them? Well, well after we were successful in the first, with our first child, our daughter, 
we set up a website, which was a gay surrogacy.co.uk to share all of our knowledge, all of the legal knowledge, uh, sample templates, everything that we had learned from the process and just shared it. And within 18 months, there were 42 other couples who began the process and used the information that we had put out there. So there's all sorts of things that we wanted to share with people and um, we just put it out there on the internet. So, you know, I, I should have asked this question, but you said you made the embryos in the U.S., but gaysurrogacy.uk sounds like it's specific to British surrogacy. Yes, it was. Tell me about what, was the surrogate U.S.? Was the surrogate in London? The surrogate was in the U.S., but according to British law, I mean, we'd only just had civil partnerships. So, and there was, you had to go to the, the equivalent of the U.K. Supreme Court to have them rule that your, the, these children that were born with your sperm through surrogacy were allowed a, a birth certificate and were, you were allowed to be, have what was called parental responsibility and be seen as the parent. So I actually represented myself in front of the high court and uh, luckily had a really nice judge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we, we went through that process there and then it, we did it again and then my partner did it the second time and represented himself in front of the high court for the second child to get parental responsibility. So it's still not very well. Um, it's not like in America where you have a very libertarian, open-minded approach. It's very traditional because you have the crown and you, it was only just a few years ago where women could actually inherit the crown where you didn't have a patrimony as being the basis upon which the crown would be determined. So, I mean, the whole society is based upon these old rules. As an American living in the UK, how did you react or how did it make you feel that you had to go through hoops to declare a child that is biologically yours to be yours? Well, we're very stoic about things because we have an entrepreneurial mindset. So it's always about going out there and making change and just doing what you need to do to make it happen. So we decide, okay, if these other guys had done it once before, we know it's possible. So we just keep plugging on, you know? And just don't beat yourself up too much when you make mistakes and just carry on. That's really our attitude to it. And was it true that you had to do this even though your kids had U.S. birth certificates? Oh, Presumably yes. your name. We had to, no, we had to actually prove that they were ours. We had to have DNA tests to prove that they were ours. And we were both, we are both British citizens. So um, it was on that basis that they were our, our, they were our DNA, probably they come from our DNA and we're British citizens that we are, we're allowed to then give our children British citizenship and we could be their parents. Yeah. In other words, we, there was all sorts of case law that came later where people tried coming from Eastern European countries where they, these were EU citizens who were not British and yet tried to bring their children into the country. And it was a nightmare. I mean, they'd be stopped at immigration. They would be accused of kidnapping. They would have to turn back. I mean, it was horrible. In fact, it was so touch and go really on our first child that we stayed for six weeks at a friend's house in Massachusetts until we could just sort out the legal aspect and get up the nerve to walk up into immigration and say, yeah, this is our child and we're not kidnapping her and to try to prove it because it's all up to that customs officer that you meet, the immigration officer, and determine whether or not he's going to, you know, make a big stink out of things. What would making a big stink look like? Would it mean taking possession of the child, you know, putting the child into foster care while they sort this whole matter out, with, you know, in the morass? That's uh, terrifying. It, it was very scary. I was, I was terrified. My partner, it took me six weeks to get the, the courage to go do it. And I was staying there and my partner flew back twice to say, okay, because he's much more brave than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm quite brave, but he's very brave. He's just like, you know what? Break the rules. Was just <laughs> he's a bit of a maverick, but I wasn't about to do that. Oh wow! Especially considering the first child had no biological connection to me, because it was his child. It's his child. So I would have been going through an international border with a child that was not mine biologically, and had no court case at that point to say that I was a parent. Wow! Yeah. So it sounds like I mean you guys are really at the cutting edge of we were at the trailblazing. Yeah. What do you think has changed as a result of people like you being the trailblazers? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's just that uh, the, the courts know how to handle things now. When you apply for a passport, 
you know, where before they would look at us like we were aliens, but now we hear from friends, you know, they, they know, oh, you're, you're a gay couple with kids and they put you aside and they have a special procedure for you. Since the, the procedure was pioneered in the United States, then there's all sorts of precedent now. It was a lot of precedent at the time in America. I mean, there were already doctors who were specializing in IVF for gay couples and there were agencies offering egg donations. So there was a, an industry that already existed in the United States where it didn't exist at all in the UK. Does it exist now? If I were a gay man or woman in the UK that wanted to go through this process without traveling to the US, is that a possibility for me? Well, here they have socialized medicine. And so the NHS, the National Health Service, I think only op will help a woman deal with a medical issue. And infertility would be the, the medical issue that would be being treated. So they offer her, I think it's two cycles of IVF on the state. And beyond that, it's up to the person to pay for that separately. But that was completely not possible for us at whatsoever. I mean, there were no, there were no gay rights. I mean, that, I, gosh. Like what was it, Section 22 or something? They couldn't even talk about gays in schools until maybe two years before we got married. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the process for gay people uh, to have a child in the UK, the law says that you have to, it has to be a known donor. So there's no such thing as anonymous donors now. Okay. Because the child is deemed to have a right to know who their parents are. So that has to be protected. And you're not allowed to pay the gestational carrier for her time or her trouble in carrying the child. So that makes things very difficult. So it means it has to be, I mean, of course, altruism is very important, but it has to be, you know, somebody who has the financial resources and wants to be altruistic, which is very rare. So surrogacy tends to be limited to, let's say, like a woman who has a sister and the woman happens to be infertile. So the sister would carry the baby on behalf of her sister using Right. Husband sperm, something like that. So that's, it's pretty limited in that regard. And it's very focused on, you know, heterosexual couples. Oh, that, that does seem quite different than what we have available here. Yeah, uh, sig significantly different and, and unfortunate. In fact, the known donor thing has been controversial as far as I understand. It... Well, th that law was passed nearly, well, over 10 years ago. Oh, it really came by dictum from the European Union. Yeah, so it, the British didn't have anything to say about it. A lot of gay rights have been imposed upon Britain um, because of they were members of the European Union, although they are not any longer. Interesting. Do you expect that surrogacy or family building options available to gay couples will change as a result of the departure from the EU? It just depends on how large is the body of gay people who would have the money to fund the, the process on their own. And there would have to be a sufficient number of these people to support an industry. So I don't know. I think mean, there need to be a critical mass before that would happen. It's been quite some time. My, my eldest daughter is 11. So my knowledge is 11 years old. That's so out of date by definition. Well, let's, let's take it from the global or the macro to the micro and talk about you guys for a minute. You now have two wonderful children. I started to talk a little bit about the many sibling or half sibling relationships that your children have. We were connected through Tammy, who has participated on this podcast, and she um, has a wonderful daughter whose name begins with the letter Z or Z in the UK. And that daughter is the half sibling of your child. Can you tell us how that came to be? Half sibling of the first, the daughter, who would, is Brad's biological child, and the full sibling of my son, who's my full biological child, Hunter. I see. I just, so they I are brother that. and sister, and they look just alike, and their personality is extremely similar, and they both play stringed instruments and are gifted in music and dance, and it's, it's uncanny. And it's like, a, it's like some sort of experiment, because we really have a hands-off approach, you know? Um, I don't try to get involved uh, what's over there, uh, mainly because... I don't want that same sense of loss that I felt with my absent father. I don't want baby Zed to feel that as well as if she is unloved or I don't care enough to be involved in her life. So the, the part of the negotiation at the beginning was that, you know, Tammy would have full authority to make all the decisions and I would, you know, stay out of it. I did sort of have some, a wish list in the beginning, sort of like, you know, it'd be nice if she could learn a musical instrument, me being a composer and... She could learn a foreign language and 
if it's at all possible to support a university education. Those were sort of some of the, the criteria I was hoping before I made the donation. So how did that come to be? Did Tammy come to you and ask? No, which... she did not at all. I... Tammy and I became friends because she represented me during these prenuptial negotiations. So you have this woman who is your legal counsel who helps you at this very pivotal moment when you and your husband are just at the beginning of your family building and she wants to start a family. What called you to offer the embryo to her? Well, we became, I became quite close with her. Um, once we had uh, Zenya, then she put us up at her house for six weeks while we sorted out all these issues in the UK. So I, I, we were already very close and I just, we were just having a conversation walking down the sidewalk. I think we were coming back from a museum or Boston Aquarium or something like that with Xenia. And um, I just said, you know, I, I have two embryos on ice and I really want to find a good home for these embryos because I felt like there were these two wonderful creatures. There was, well, so first of all, there were other embryos, but these two were the ones that passed all the tests that had divided into, you know, vibrant little embryos that had lots of potential that the doctor said, oh, these are the good ones. And so there, I had two and there were girls. We knew there were girls. And so we didn't know what to do. What to do um, so because the second, the second set of uh, IVF, we wanted a boy because we had already had a girl. So, I mean, these were the leftover, uh, leftover embryos. And I just felt, you know, I know it was very unpopular at the moment with being so politically charged, but I'm coming from my religious background. I mean, I don't believe in abortion. And so even through the whole IVF process, we only ever put one embryo in at a time because we never wanted to be in a position to have to abort one of the children. We had a friend, for example, in California, he put five in and then he had this horrible decision he had to make. So we didn't want to be in that position either. So then I started thinking, oh my gosh, you know, if I have this stance about abortion, then what am I doing with these embryos who are basically in stasis? These are these little lives who are in stasis. And it just occurred to me, like, there was a person in need who was worthy and capable and really had a passion and wanted a child so badly. And I just thought, wow, you know, I, so I said to her, I said, you know, I have these two embryos and I'd be willing to donate them to you. And it's subject to me talking to my husband first, which I later did. And he's like, yeah, okay, if you want to do that, that's great. He was okay with it. So, but yeah, that's how it came about. It was just like an offer. And then she just couldn't believe it. She, the look in her eyes, it was like a, a deer in the headlines, just absolutely stunned. Yeah. And then she, she sort of indicated that she was interested, but then thought about it in a very rational way and came back to us a little later. Yeah. You used the word altruism earlier with reference to gestational carriers in the UK. This feels like a big altruistic moment. Did you feel that sense of, oh my gosh, I'm giving something? Yes, because there's no money that changed hands. Yeah. Um, you no, know, absolutely. I mean, I, I always feel like I come from a very religious background and I still have a, a very, I know, I just have a sense of God's presence in my life at every moment. And I just felt like I'd been given this gift and I received it and I need to then give it back. So this is how I felt. That's beautiful. And how does it feel to watch uh, your biological child get raised in a different country by somebody that's other than you? Well, it's fascinating. First of all, you know, she will call up and um, play a piece that she's learning on the cello or, and, uh, or a piece on the piano. And I'm like, wow, that's great. And I can just, you know, you can see that she, some of the, the aptitudes and talents that I was born with have been passed on. And that's really lovely. I think maybe it was easy because I had this, this distant relationship it, from like me having a broken family that it was it was maybe easier for me to just sort of say, okay, you, you raise that child and you have your way. And I really do stay out of this. I'm, I'm, I'm careful because I don't want there to be any conflict or bad feelings because in the future, there's going to be a point where she's going to want to know where her father is and that's going to be me. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm going to, you know, accept that. And, um, and if she's going to come to me for help or information or guidance, I'm going to, I'm going to be in a position to do that. I, uh, if I'm asked. I don't want to control. I don't want to control. Yeah. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be a good vibe. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be constructive. Yeah. And I imagine if you're witnessing somebody raise this child on a day-to-day -day basis, it might be harder to stay out of it, right? To, to have that boundary, but because oh, there's definitely. this distance. Yeah. And you said the word father earlier, you know, that I would be her father she, if she needed anything. Biological uh, father. Biological yeah. father. Yeah. I was going to ask, what, what's the right terminology? How do you think about it for yourself? Well, I, I mean, I do think of myself as a biological father, but I also feel like there is a sense of duty that's inescapable. 
um, yeah, I, I think that there are certain sort of obligations that are going to sort of present themselves. Sure. How did you explain it to your kids that there's, how well, old the were they? Beginning. Yeah. yeah. So from the very, very beginning, I, I never wanted there to be a moment of, you know, an aha moment and a surprise where they would have this kind of weird cognitive dissonance. So from the very beginning, I was just telling them, look, you know, this is the egg and this is the tummy mummy and this is the egg mummy. And, you know, we would introduce her to the gestational carrier. And so, yeah, we were just completely open from the very beginning. And that was good because if we hadn't done that, by the time they got to school and their friends started asking questions, that would have been extremely awkward. Sure. So, Absolutely. So, so you had had those conversations and then you were able to say, there's another tummy mummy, there's another mom that's raising yeah. this child. But even before baby Zed was even in the picture, of course, there were two other daughters. There were two other girls who come from the same egg donor who we know. That's baby P1 and baby P2. Um, and we know them. And so, and we've met them on the several occasions. And Xenia knows that those are half sisters. But that family, as far as I know, I haven't spoken to them for a while. They hadn't said anything yet. They're going to, their position was they were going to wait till they were older so they could fully understand it. So, yeah, because we're not so close that it hasn't been necessary to have that conversation. Sure. But our kids know, but her kids don't know about our okay. kids. If you were ever to get together, get your kids together, you'd have to be cautious about language. Yeah, I think in my mind, how I've organized it is that when we do go and visit in Maine and they meet the two girls, P1 and P2, that'll be the point when their mother tells them. And so then they get to see their, their you know, half brothers and sisters. After that happens, we sort that little dynamic out. Then it'll be sort of family reunion time. And then we could yeah. all get together. <laughs> So people like me who have single or single parents and choose to have sperm donors, sometimes there are those reunions and they're very intentional and people have this debate. Do I want to know the other half siblings or not? It sounds to me like you're very open to having the big, the big connective moment, if possible. I just think that, you know, I've lived through a cancer scare and four-way bypass heart surgery. So I sort of, on my third life, and I'm just thinking, you know, what's going to happen when I'm gone and what's happened when my, my partner's gone it? they need to know that they have other family out there. I mean, if it comes down to kidney or liver donation or blood donation or who knows what it's going to be, they need to know. Yeah. You've been very open with your kids about the various ways in which the family was constructed. You've mentioned a tummy mummy. You've talked to them about the egg donation. You've talked to them about their half siblings. And so you've taken a very open approach philosophically to your parenting with these children. And the approach that on the other side of the pond, your peer parent has taken is a little bit different. What are your thoughts about these two different communication styles? I often wonder how baby Zed, because I have been introduced, but as, as a family friend, and I just wonder, you know, how much of a shock it will be when she does know, because I took such a different approach with my kids being open from the very beginning. So it, that I'm, you know, it's unfamiliar territory. It's a lot of unknowns and there's a little bit of apprehension, maybe a little bit of fear. Yeah. yeah. What is the fear telling you? Is it, are you afraid of her not embracing you or embracing you too much or that she's going to have this cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance? Like I'm you're worried about I'm, kids? I'm afraid of a sense of abandonment and I'm afraid I don't want her to ever think that there was something wrong with her, which is why I didn't want to be involved. That would be horrible. So that's, I'm, that's sort of the one thing I want to situation that will manage. Yeah, because she's so wonderful, such a such an amazing child, and uh, Tammy's such a great mom to her. So um, you know she lacks for nothing, and she's thriving. And so I don't think she's going to feel a loss. I don't know. It's maybe part of that fear and s sense of loss that I have is because I'm born in the early '70s, and there's still a lot of traditional mores, norms, and I mean, I remember being ostracized because my parents were divorced. My mother wasn't even allowed into certain social groups because she'd been divorced. Oh. So, you know, I mean, a lot of this is sort of in my head, in my baggage. Yeah. Gonna... I remember even by my own family at family reunions on my mother's side, this sense of kind of we being the outcasts and not really fully accepted. It's almost like we'd kind of crashed the party in a way, just not fully accepted. But you know what's odd about that is that when I ask some of the family members now that I'm an adult and I can process some of these thoughts, 
they go, oh, we never felt like that at all. But it was something I picked up, you know, in the, in the ether, that maybe as a society as a whole, very conservative society. I grew up in Wyoming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, an, it's important to make that distinction between what your family felt and what a child picks up because it's exactly your fear with baby Zed. I think that, you know, it's what the kids say at school. Mm-hmm. You know, like my daughter, for example, there was a child who went say, so I just don't understand. They said, how can you have two dads? That doesn't make any sense. You know, who's your dad? Who's your mom? And then you know, they ask these awkward questions. And then all of a sudden it goes, as much as I couch the situation as being a blessing or a double blessing, you have two dads. Lots of kids don't have a dad, you know, stuff like that. What the kid picks up at school amongst her peers is going to be a different message. And it's probably going to be a moment where she feels she, of, she's lacking rather than in abundance. That's the part that I, it's just that little perception because others will impose that on her unless she has an incredibly strong sense of identity. Yeah. If we go back to the way baby Z is being raised and your kids are being raised, you've got a clear, direct biological connection between your son and baby Z. They are siblings yes. biologically, but they're being raised in different households. You mentioned that you see a lot of similarities between the two of them. Has that shaped your perception of nature versus nurture? Um, it contributed to it. I think, you know, physical characteristics, definitely nature, you know, um, like metabolism and physical prowess, things like that. And probably intelligence in terms of how quickly the brain processes information is, is nature. But the nurture stuff, the nurture is all about, for me, once your body has, you know, taken in these signals from the external environment, the nurture is the part that informs how are you going to respond to it? That's the part that I sort of spend my time with my kids is trying to say, look, you have a choice here. Are you going to freak out? Are you going to take a breath and you know, stop, think, and then act? Or what are you going to do? So that's the nurture part. And of course, then the, the, the music part, for example, I mean, I spend, I wake my kids up at five o'clock every morning and they have a music lesson for one hour each. And um, if it wasn't for me developing their musical talent, they definitely wouldn't have done it on their own. And yet they're, Super talented. My daughter just received from the Royal Academy of Music a, a, the highest distinction in her grade four. So she has this ability. But if I've, I've tried it the other way, right, or push, oh, she, she would just be a hot mess. <laughs> you yeah. know, good. So you got the nurtures. The nurture is really important. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, that's so interesting. It's, it's an antiquated debate in some ways. You know, I don't think we're talking about nature versus nurture as much as the various options for family building has evolved. But it's interesting, given that you've got so many examples of nurturing children in your life and creating children in your life. So, yeah, book and baby Senate obviously has these talents. I mean, she dances and has this physical aptitude that my son has. They move in the same ways with it, and they kind of operate on the same in, in the same high speed, and just naturally sing songs and make songs up and creative and. That stuff has nothing to do with nurture. That's all nature. It's amazing. That's amazing. One final question, and that is, we've talked about all these different um, permutations of family. You've got your nuclear family. You've got the family in which you were raised. And then this extended broader family from the context of these half and full siblings. How do you define family? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I basically had to get the heck out of Wyoming. so. Although I had this family, I was always I mean, secretly gay and I always felt like I had to get out of there in order to survive because it wasn't long after that that the whole Matthew Shepard thing happened where they tied that poor boy to the barbed wire and beat him to death at the end of a rifle. I and mean, this is where I grew up. And so I just had to get the heck out of there. So I had this nuclear family, traditional nuclear family, but it wasn't doing anything for me. You know, uh, my mother had been divorced. She'd been remarried. The guy... He tolerated us, basically, showed no interest, no support. And then when I moved to university, I, I wasn't even, didn't even come out as gay until my junior year at university. And then at that point, you know, they have, you have the whole gay family. You choose your family. That, so then I, thought, I believed in that for a while. And now that I'm raising the kids, I think family is the people that you choose to surround yourself who are willing to give their time towards this, like, mutual goal of you know, being kind or being a good role model or supporting the kids. Like, for example, you know, you have, like, we have this friend called Auntie Hawa. She's had no relation to us whatsoever, but she's the most wonderful, arguably one of the most wonderful women I've ever met. 
And so she's Auntie Hall when she's definitely family. Mm. So I think we, it's just people who choose to, to apply themselves to this mutual kind of activity of raising the child. You know, it takes a village, they say. I, I think so. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Well, that's beautiful. I really loved talking to you. Um, this has been a really special awesome. conversation. You're allowing me the opportunity to share my story. Absolutely. Well, this is, it's so kind of you to donate your time in this way. I've loved getting to know you. Thank you for your time. Likewise. Thank you. Have yeah. a great day. Thank you for listening to Storked with your host, Julia Carroll. This podcast is changing the conversation around the ways people define and create family. If you like what you hear, please support us by sharing with friends and following on Instagram at Storked underscore podcast. We also always appreciate it when you rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information, visit storkedpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter. That's S-T-O-R-K-D podcast.com.